Welcome in, everyone, and welcome to yet another DVDD special. These are going to become a, hopefully, anyways, a regular on this Mile High Huddle YouTube channel. Tonight, joining me is my co-host, former co-host, kind of up in the air co-host, Lance Anderson of the Dove Valley Deep Divers. Lance, it's been a while since we've seen you. We've, you know, I've talked about it on Dove Valley Deep Divers, and you even mentioned it before you were gone. But you have to take a step away due to a new job. How's everything going? How are you doing? Uh, doing good. And yeah, I just I, I appreciate everybody for having some patience with me with my new work schedule. As soon as I can get that kind of figured out, we'll see if I can get back on Dove Valley Deep Divers full time. But as it stands, uh, just not going to have the time to be able to commit to the show and do the, the good deep dives that we do for you guys every single Friday night. But for now, we'll be able to hang out with each other at least for you know 10 to 15 minutes every now and again and do these quick little dvdd specials so I'm, I'm glad to be back in the saddle glad to be back with you eric it's good to be here man i'm excited to be a, a part of this with you and going forward hopefully we can do some more of these down the road yeah so this is the third one so far that we've done the first two coach luke poglish joined me we got to talk about the different fronts that the denver broncos use you know and talk about the differences between the four three and the three four as well as getting into some of those five down five man down looks and two man down looks or down man looks we also talked about some of the coverages primarily the differences between cover one through cover six and hopefully those of you tuning in if you guys didn't know some of that stuff you guys learned something from coach Bogles when he i mean that was his goal when he reached out to me about doing those kinds of episodes mm -hmm. hopefully we can get him back on but season does start here soon for him and he's going to be busy so today we are switching gears a little bit a little bit more you know in depth into the broncos here being able to you know live up to the name of the dove valley deep divers and deep dive into this during the offseason we've kind of hinted at it a little bit and talked about it about the biggest weaknesses on both sides of the ball today we're going to look at the offensive side of the ball outside of quarterback because you know in modern day nfl you live or die by quarterback play so we're going to take that out of the equation because you know, without knowing who the starting quarterback is, it is very easy to say that is the biggest weakness. Um, the battle is still ongoing. I have there's there's been an update on milehighhuddle.com that I did that you guys can check out. Talks about all the updates on these Broncos uh, camp battles that are going on. Probably will still be a little while. Probably sometime after August 11th, I believe, is the first preseason game that we'll find out who the starting quarterback is. So, biggest weakness on the Broncos offense. Outside of the quarterback position, Lance, what position would you give it to? If I had to go a singular position, it's pretty obvious to me that this tight end group is the one that has, I don't want to say the biggest weakness, but the biggest question mark surrounding it. And if you're listening to everything that's going on throughout the first couple of days of training camp, Greg Dulcich has really shined over the last couple of days where he's showing that explosiveness. He looks healthy. He looks to be that dynamic pass catching uh, playmaking player that the Broncos drafted two years ago. But again, you just don't know if this guy is going to be healthy for you for at least 12 games, let alone 16 to 17 games. So if he can actually show that this this dynamic playmaking ability that he has is going to be there for you for the majority of the season, then the Broncos really do finally have that weapon that they can utilize and rely upon to help accentuate this offense. The big thing, though, whether you want to talk about the tight end position, wide receiver, running back, does not matter. To me, the biggest weakness that this Broncos offense has, at least as it stands right now, is consistent explosive playmaking ability out of all of your skill position players. You understand you've got Greg Dulcich in that ability. He's showing it right now. Marvin Mims still needs to take a big step forward. He showed those flash plays last season. That would be a huge boon for this Broncos offense. Obviously, Troy Franklin being there. You get um, Cortland Sutton with his uh, high point catches, the deep downfield contested catch situations. That's going to be a great thing here. Jaleel McLaughlin coming out of the backfield. Yeah, those are all fine players. We can talk about them in a little nutshell. But the conglomerate, the entire sum of all of these parts, Going back to that quarterback situation, how consistently can you create plays of 15 to 20 plus yards and create an explosive offense moving forward? To me, that is the biggest weakness of this offense. and It's the biggest question mark Sean Payton needs to figure out. Yeah, and I may have misspoke earlier when I said, I think I said position, biggest, weakest, the weakest position, and I just meant the biggest weakness in general on the Broncos offense. And I actually am in agreement with you is this offense lacks explosives, whether it comes in the passing game or the run game. They were one of the least explosive offenses yep. last year. 
Sure, they hit some of them, and they were big plays. Everybody remembers those two big plays to Marvin Mims against the Washington Commanders, but they just didn't have any consistency getting explosives. Now, explosives are 10-plus yard runs or 15-plus yard passing plays. Yep. Um, that is how you measure an explosive play in the NFL nowadays, and they just need more of it. And as you said, I mean, you need Marvin Mims to step up. Greg Dulcich was looking like, granted, it was only for about a half, last year like a key part in helping this offense be explosive by dictating matchups but then he goes down with the hamstring injury he works back from that re-hurts his hamstring injury then looks like he's about to come back from the second hamstring injury and he hurts his foot which has sidelined him up until training camp but long story short is they need him to stay on the field because of what he can do adam trotman he's not an explosive tight end he's not going to get you very many explosives they need Marvin Mims, Troy Franklin to step up, and even if it's going to be a limited role, Jaleel McLaughlin, I think, is another one that really needs to step up here because mm -hmm. it has been highlighted multiple times about his issues in the passing game as a receiver. To help them get more explosives, especially out of the backfield, they need him to be a little bit more versatile, showing up when it matters as a receiver out of the backfield to you know, help and make the offense a little less predictable for it being a run play because last year he, when he was on the field like 70 percent of his snaps he ran the ball yep. and like five more percent when he was at least targeted so we need more out of him there's just a lot that goes into it but basically you live or die by explosives i can't remember the exact stats now but you are like six times more likely to score and it, it's simple understand a uh, uh, simple thing to understand here bigger plays basically help you score quicker help you score faster teams with more explosives typically ha have a significantly higher uh points per game as well as a little bit lower of a time of possession mm -hmm. bigger plays score quicker move the ball quicker now changing focus a little bit away from the biggest weakness on the broncos offense Got a little bit ahead of myself when I said position. Now let's dive into that aspect of it. What is the biggest, the weakest position on this Broncos offense? See, it, it's it's so fun because we just talked about the tight end position. And yes, we, we have the Greg Dulcich conversation. You talked about Adam Troutman just a little bit. Every time that he turns around, Sean Payton is throwing out gigantic praise for Lucas Kroll relative unknown. Let's talk to the things that we do know right now. And I'm going to throw, I, I talked about this a, a while ago on another show and I, I forgive for, uh, forgive me for throwing the plug here. This wide receiver room. I think that there's an issue here with this wide receiver room, because there are a lot of people that think that it's going to be an explosive dynamic room that has a lot of moving parts. And it's just going to, we, we got all these great players, prove it to me. Can this wide receiver room prove it to me that they are actually what everyone thinks they're going to be? Whether it's Cortland Sutton, who just got his deal reworked to get some more incentives, not likely to be earned. Like, this is not likely to be earned incentives for him. You've got Marvin Mims, again, with the explosive play banking potential. He's got to take that big next step forward. Tim Patrick, we don't know his health situation right now. Troy Franklin, what is his role going to look like in this room? Devon Vele, uh, you've got Josh Reynolds is a, a kind of an – understory a guy that's not really getting a lot of praise for what he does bring but still massive massive question marks here i think we need to talk about this wide receiver room compared like combined with the with the quarterback position and start to talk about how much this receiver room is really a weakness on this roster more than it is a strength because we talked about it on dvdd a couple of weeks ago who is wide receiver five six seven and eight right now you know who one through four are gonna be they're they're, they're it's Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick, Marvin Mims, Troy Franklin. That's one, two, three, and four. Who's five, Josh six, Reynolds. seven, and eight? Uh, Josh Reynolds, excuse me. Who's five, six, seven, and eight? Yeah. How does how does this wide receiver room shake up? And I think that that's a, a a big undercard that really needs to get more focus from Broncos country. And then also throwing that in is Michael Bandy has been getting a lot of hype through training camp yeah. early on yep. here um, with his reliability. Basically, I believe it was Ryan Edwards who tweeted out at one of the days that he's basically he basically was catching anything that was thrown his way. Now I'm a little surprised that you went receiver, especially with tight end with how much, you know, on Dove Valley deep divers that you and I have hounded the tight end position and center Yeah, where we, the like seems to be Luke Wattenberg is starting to, you know, not necessarily run away with, but separate himself for that position. I haven't seen anything um, they re, uh, about the padded practice yet. Um, 
and we're getting into that. And, you know, that can really help the offensive uh, – settle offensive line positions when you're in camp battles there because of the limitations of contact without pads versus with pads. But for me – and this is going to grind a lot of gears – I'm going offensive tackle, and part of this is the positional value here of offensive tackle. Yeah, You paid out a lot of money to Mike McGlinchey. Garrett Bowles is reliable. He's solid, but he's in the final year of his deal. And when I'm looking at – also, I should clarify this too. When I'm looking at the biggest weakness here on offense, it's not just this year. Mm-hmm. So even beyond this year, you don't have a replacement for Garrett Bowles in place. You need to get an extension done or find somebody, which means Matt Pert or Alex Palchewski or one of these other backup tackles, Demontre Jacobs or Frank Crum, start showing something to potentially be that guy. But you also need Mike McGlinchey to be more consistent and reliable, mm-hmm. especially with how much you paid him, because you can move on from him after this season this position it's fine with your starting two it's you're not great because of the consistency concerns with mike mcglinchy and when you look at garrett bulls he tends to have that one good year and last year was a good year stayed healthy stayed out there on the field yeah and it's typically followed i mean ever since 2020 basically it's then followed by a down year or a year where he deal gets hurt or deals with injuries and if either of these guys go down there is no backup swing tackle on this roster. Yes. And with how valuable having that backup swing tackle is and tackle is in general, offensive tackle for me is one of the is probably the weakest position here. I mean, it's so easy to talk about center, but centers are a position that typically you can find relatively easily. Um, at least a quality guy. And there's some quality options on in free agency. Connor Williams got some good news about being able to pass the physical with Seattle, but hasn't signed at the moment of recording this. Connor McGovern's still out there who, yeah, he comes, he's coming back from an injury, but he's been reliable with the Jets. So there are options out there. And then at tight end, it's all about the health. Can Greg Dulcich stay healthy? Can Lucas mm-hmm. Kroll t- take the step forward? And wide receiver, you had some valid points here, but I think you're getting at least some reliability and you have a higher floor, I think, with the wide receiver room than you do with the, t- than the tackles room because one injury to one of those guys and just the floor falls out out so definitely is a tough spot and of course taking out the quarterback position here now just to throw a slight curveball at you here before we get out of here would wide receivers still be the biggest the weakest position for you if you were including quarterbacks no uh, i i don't think so and a big reason why is because at least you let me clarify this you know what you're going to get in Cortland Sutton. You know the expected role of a Marvin Mims and what he's supposed to bring. You know the expected role of a Tim Patrick. If you have the, an exact quarterback dynamic that you can understand how to work with those receivers, sure, you, you, you can at least be a little bit more comfortable with it. And I'm not trying to say that this receiver room is a weakness as a whole. I'm just saying we need to talk about this more mm-hmm. as a weakness as it should be talked about. I'm in full agreement with you. The offensive line depth overall, whether it's center, into your guard, uh, into your offensive line, or even out on the, on the swing tackles. Yes, depth on the offensive line is a big problem to me. Talking specifically about the starters here, though, this wide receiver room has more questions than it has answers as it currently stands. It's almost as bad as a tight end room. At least the starting five on the offensive line is safe for center, the starting four at least. The, you got you know what you're going to get out of those guys. Praise good health. Praise their ability to, to at least have that continuity. This wide receiver room doesn't have any of that. And they don't have a, a, a quarterback that can understand how to utilize those guys in the proper way. So that, to me, brings more questions in that particular aspect. So, it, again, it's more of a hypothetical, not really hypothetical, more of an outside-the-box way of thinking and bringing that in terms of a weakness and really saying that is the weakest position because I'm in agreement with you. The offensive line depth is probably the worst offensive line depth in at least the AFC. Yeah, they got really lucky last year being able to stay healthy for the majority of the season, obviously. Yep. What, Mike McGlinchey missed the final two games, final yep. game? Um, something like that. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head at the still, moment. He still played right at 950 total snaps, though. That's the majority yeah. of the I season. I mean, he, they, the same unit started majority of the season together, mm-hmm. which is just unheard of. Bonkers. But yeah, quarterback for me, if you throw that in there, the positional value there skyrockets it. Yep. But guys, that's going to do it for us. We will be back and talking about the de- biggest weakness on the defensive side of the ball. Make sure you guys leave a like. Make sure you guys are subscribed to the Mile High Huddle YouTube channel here. Seeing as the majority of the time, most viewers on videos on YouTube are not actually subscribed to the channel. 
And if you guys have any questions for us or any comments, make sure you leave them in the comment section down below. Thank you guys for watching as my camera freezes up. Hope you guys have a wonderful night, wonderful evening, wonderful day, all depending on when this goes up. Thank you guys for watching, and we hope to see you again next time.